Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program that takes you through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. Now today we begin a book called Ecclesiastes. What in the world does that mean? It was written by Solomon. We'll talk about that still to come. Corey is here also to help us. Corey, what'd you do? I'm going to be focusing in on the authorship and the structure of the book of Ecclesiastes. Very good. Excellent job. And uh, what's today? Today's Friday. Today is Friday. So that means we have a fabulous question for you from Ecclesiastes chapter one. Why can you have a question every single Friday? <laughs> oh, well. Ryan, what's up today? Today I'm profiling one of Israel's most famous or perhaps infamous judges, Samson. All right, very good. That's going to be a good one. Get your Bible guide out if you have it and get your most important book ever. It's called the Bible. And let's begin to study the book of Ecclesiastes as we look to what God has said. Today, as we begin to study through the book of Ecclesiastes, you and I are going to be focusing in on not only the authorship of this ancient book, but also the structure as well and, and what genre it belongs to, which is, of course, ancient wisdom literature. But it's a different form and different type of wisdom literature than the book of Proverbs, which should be pretty apparent when you begin to read it. Take a look. The English title Ecclesiastes comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew word used in the book's very first verse, Koheleth. This Hebrew word is translated into English Bibles as the word teacher, and it's how the author refers to himself throughout the book. But Koheleth isn't the usual Hebrew word for teacher. In fact, its only use in the Bible is in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's believed the word more literally means assembly leader, or maybe even public speaker. The author also identifies himself as a son of David and king of Jerusalem over all Israel. This leaves King Solomon as the only option. He was the only king after David to rule over united Israel. After him, Israel split and the kings of Jerusalem only ruled over the new smaller nation of Judah. The book of Ecclesiastes fits into a greater genre of ancient wisdom literature and relates most closely to works that existed before the reign of Solomon, which supports the idea that it was written as early as Solomon's reign and not much later in history. Ecclesiastes was written in monologue form and fits into a subcategory referred to as literature of pessimism. Scholars believe that it's comparable with wisdom literature from Mesopotamia and Egypt, and that the text of Ecclesiastes even reveals its author was familiar with some of this literature. Interestingly, the Bible itself pits Solomon up against the wisdom of Egypt and Mesopotamia in 1 Kings 4, which then makes sense of him writing in a similar genre and referencing or making allusions to these other works in his dialogue. It's worth noting that while the author alludes to these other pieces of wisdom literature, he concludes his book differently. After wrestling with the issue of how to cope in a world full of suffering and meaninglessness, the other known wisdom concludes that one should just enjoy life. Solomon, on the other hand, adds an important caveat, enjoy life and fear God. Like his other biblical writings, Solomon's focus and solution is God-centered, which stands in contrast to the comparable literature of the day. One of the really interesting qualities about the book of Ecclesiastes is that it provides the reader the opportunity to see a different side of King Solomon. So in the Bible, we get not only the historical account of Solomon in the books of Kings and Chronicles uh, and uh, his backstory really in, in the book of 2 Samuel, but we also get to see his authorship style and his personality come out in the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and soon we're going to be getting into a Song of Solomon. So we see a dynamic dynamic range of his ability to write. And a lot of people have, have issue, and, and I think rightly so, have issue with this concept of uh, King Solomon, who is, for all intents and purposes, a failed king. Uh, not physically, humanly speaking, he did all the right things in terms of he was able to grow his nation. But spiritually, he was rather a failure, and that's made obvious in the books of Kings and Chronicles, uh, especially in Chronicles, with the chronicler pointing out all the ways that Solomon failed 
failed to follow God and, and what it did to his heart near the end of his life. So why then do we see Solomon writing books of wisdom literature? Well, that was Solomon's thing. He had the head knowledge. He really knew he had the head knowledge and he had the heart knowledge of how to follow God and how to pontificate. And really he knew wisdom from foolishness, but he wasn't able to follow his own advice. So this needs to be one of our takeaways from this book is we need to pray and ask God to enable us to have the strength to follow through on his wisdom. Ecclesiastes is thought to be remarkable, but sad if one does not read the whole book. Beginning with this, vanity, vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, chapter one, verse two. And it ends with, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil chapter 12, verses 13 to 14. You know, this book is really about man's work and existence. How we see our work depends on the God of heaven. We should know and understand this sacred provision. Our very existence is dependent upon God. So what we do and how we see things depends on how we view our Lord. Interestingly, it is believed that Solomon wrote this book at the end of his life, while his father David wrote the book of Psalms. God's wisdom is not everything. It is only a part of God's character. God is defined by truth and mercy as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises, and the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south, and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually, and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Men cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. You know, the book of Ecclesiastes is absolutely amazing. It really is. And I know I use that adjective a lot, but I, I mean that. Listen to the first verse of these chapters. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanity, all is vanity, says the preacher. What does man gain by the toil which he tolls under the sun? I mean, it is an amazing chapter as we begin this study of Ecclesiastes. And you know, as we look at this, I think it's important for us to realize that God placed it in his Bible, in his eternal word. So get your Bible guide out and turn to today's passage. As we do that, 
I want to encourage you that the Bible guide gives us the day's passage plus the three points that we're going to be talking about, but it also gives us a prayer for today. And it gives us thoughts at the end that are not on the television program that I very much encourage you to be a part of. And I write the Bible guide so that we understand, you and I understand what we're studying. Today is one of those days, and over the next two days, we're going to begin to study the book of Ecclesiastes. What does this mean to us? And how are we to take this? Very, very interesting. As we look at the ways of truth, we focus on something interesting. Nothing under the sun, S-U-N, nothing under the sun. What does that mean? It means that he's talking about the earth. He's talking about the universe. And so there's another universe above this universe, which is God's heaven. So that's interesting. We need to keep that in mind. Also, we're going to read Ecclesiastes 1 to 3. It's an excellent book. And we're looking at Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 11. And as we look at that, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would learn, that we would understand what the Bible is saying to us, especially today, Lord Jesus, as we read these passages. Help us to get it. Help no one to misunderstand what you're saying. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen. Look at the first verse again, and this is very important because as we study these verses, we need to realize that God is saying something very important through Solomon, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 8. It says, the words of the preacher, calls himself a preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then he says this, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. He says, what profit has a man from all his labor, which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers came, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. Not satisfied with seeing? That's right. Nor is the ear filled with hearing. Now, this is fascinating. We need to understand that we cannot understand the meaning of the world when bound by sin. We must come to Jesus Christ. Now, this is what I like to say is that the Bible, they say here that, uh, and many people say in today's world, well, the Bible, you know, it's not a textbook. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a religious book. And I say, well, no, absolutely wrong. I think you're incorrect. I think the Bible is a book about the history of mankind. And I think the Bible is the only people in it were exposed to it at that time, Adam and Eve. I do not think they're allegories. I believe they were real people. And I, I think about this and I, I say to scientists, because there's two kinds, there's the historical scientists of man and then there's the Bible believers. And most people believe in the idea that the earth is millions of years old. They've got to come up with time to solve this problem. And it doesn't solve the problem. In fact, it takes more faith to believe in the old earth than it does to believe in God. Very interesting. Unless we are born again, unless we understand that the Bible's telling us something here that we need to know, we're not going to get it. Look at Ecclesiastes 1 through 9. It says, that which has been, or that which has been, is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. Now, what does that mean? Everything looks the same under sin. God makes all things new when we come to him in salvation. This simply says that as we look at it, as we understand what, what it means to get saved, what it means to be born again, it means that nothing is new 
until we come to Jesus Christ. Now, let, let me tell you something. When we come to Jesus Christ, and I came to Jesus Christ, made him Lord of my life, it changed everything. I mean, I saw things, I, I was like, wow, that is amazing. It's not just about here. But things that I do, things that I work on, affect the afterlife. And I, I saw that responsibility from the afterlife all the way through. That's very important. So when we understand that, we get it. We don't get our mind wrapped up down here. Look at Ecclesiastes verse 1, or chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. It says, is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no new remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after now, Hebrew poetry is fascinating. History seems pointless and even useless when we do not know Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. So important. History is of no value to anybody who thinks that we're all new now. And this is, you know, with all the new technology, the Internet and everything else. Let me tell you something. The Internet would be nothing without human beings. Human beings have been here for many years. And we need to understand that human nature has not changed, that we are bound under sin. Sin is a concept that we invited into our life when we disobeyed God at the beginning. And that has taken its toll through time. And let me tell you, this is the time when sin is really taking its toll. But if we come to Jesus Christ and we say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, then sin has no bind on us. Very important. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be talking about the 7th to the ninth chapter of Ecclesiastes. And this is interesting because we're going to discuss what it means not to have eternal life. And a lot of people will think about that. So make sure you join us next time on Quick Study Television, right? Well, today in our studies, we travel to a time in biblical history when everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. There were not yet any Jewish kings, but God raised up leaders to judge and deliver his people from the hand of the Philistines. And the man who would begin to deliver Israel from this pagan people is Samson. And though he was mostly reckless, God still used the situation to deliver his people. Let's study. Prior to the rule of any Israelite king, when everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, was born Samson. Even before the womb, God had ordained him to be a judge among his people and to begin delivering the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. He was to be a Nazarite, one set apart to God from birth. But his reckless behavior and weakness for women made him seem a very poor choice. At first, everything seemed to be going according to plan. Samson grew and the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. But Samson decided to marry a Philistine woman, which aggravated his parents. Yet there was no talking him out of it. This choice set him on a deadly collision course with the Philistines. Deadly for them, deadly for him. Indeed, though Samson's parents were unaware, God was using this opportunity to ultimately bring the Philistines to ruin. It first began to manifest during the seven-day wedding feast. For when Samson discovers that he has been conspired against by his bride and some Philistines over a wager he made, he leaves in a rage. When he returns and finds that his wife has been given over to another man, he burns the Philistines' grain fields, vineyards, and olive groves. 
When the Philistines return fire and burn his wife and her father, Samson makes a great slaughter of them all. Though Samson returned home, he would soon be arrested by his own people and delivered back to the Philistines. However, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and with nothing more than a donkey's jawbone, he slew a thousand men. Although the Philistines would make another attempt upon Samson during his one night stay with a harlot in Gaza, he once again escaped. For 20 years, Samson had overpowered and eluded the Philistines, but all of that was about to change. For when they learn of Samson's love for Delilah, they offer her a significant sum of silver if she can discover the secret of Samson's power. After a great deal of enticement, Samson finally breaks down. No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. Now exposed, Delilah lulls Samson to sleep and has his head shaved. In moments, the angry Philistine mob is upon him, but he is powerless. So he is blinded, shackled, and imprisoned. Yet Samson's divine mission was not yet complete. Indeed, sometime later, when his hair had partially returned, he is brought to the Philistine temple for the entertainment of thousands. But Samson sets himself between two supporting pillars, and in one last prayer he pleads with God, let me die with the Philistines. So he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. You know, many have a hard time understanding how God could have endorsed Samson's behavior. For example, the account speaks of Samson's marriage to the Philistine woman as if it's actually from God. But Israelites were not to intermarry with outsiders. So what's going on here? Well, I like what Bible scholar Dale Davis says about this. He says that, yes, Yahweh was the one seeking an occasion against the Philistines, but that doesn't mean God condoned everything Samson did or the way that he did it. The sin of Samson must not be attributed to the Lord, but the deliverance of the Israelites by Samson was from the Lord. Remember, scriptural language frequently attributes directly to God what he merely permits. Samson surely was directed by God to seek an occasion against the Philistines and to lead the Israelites in breaking out from under their yoke. But Samson did not take the time to inquire of the Lord how or in what legitimate ways he might do this. Nor did he seek divine guidance when his parents questioned his seeking a bride among the Philistines. All that mattered was whether he was pleased, whether his choice was right in his own eyes. Little wonder then that he would only begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Perhaps his potential for greatness was cut short by his vices, his partaking too deeply of the cultural appetites of his day. May we not be like Samson. Let's seek God's face and inquire of him what he would have us do. You know, Ryan, there's many uh, uh, takes on Samson, and um, it, it really is interesting. God has shown us that he can use anybody, anytime, anywhere, uh, because he has, although he has dedicated people to have certain gifts and talents, that doesn't mean that they'll truly serve him. Right, yeah. And, you know, God has expressed himself in many cultures around the world, and we, we can't write off the cultures, but at the same time, through Jesus Christ, we are saved. So we need to pay attention to that. Yeah. Very important. I think, too, it's interesting that as we read about these people, we can call them characters, but they truly are people mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. read about. When we see those flaws, and that's what the Bible allows us to see, is human nature in here, we can see bits of ourselves and see some of the decisions that we would possibly mm -hmm. make. And it's a very good reminder. I mean, we can point fingers at these, at these people, uh, but our lives aren't displayed in such a way that people, you know, are reading about the choice that, that we've made. And so I think it's a really good reminder for us to, um, to, to maybe not repeat some of the things that, that we might do. Mm -hmm. well, that's the reason that God has, has put these things in the Bible so that mm -hmm. we can see this. So yeah. that's very important. And by the way, just as a, a mention here, we are on a station in the Vancouver area. We're on in prime time and uh, we need your help. So if you can help us, that'd be great. If you're watching in the Vancouver area, it is great to be there in prime time, good to be in a part of what's going on, but we need your help to continue. So thank you very much. Pray about it and ask what God would have you do for the Vancouver area to make sure that we are able to stay on the air. Very, very important. Thank you so much. Now, you have Are you a feeling fabulous? I'm not, but you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. come on. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm feeling, feeling fabulous uh, we are. 
I'm feeling partially <laughs> I can feel fabulous. fabulous radiating from well, this side of, of the table. Fabulous is I on don't that know. side. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of you, this is your very first time through the Bible, and I want to commend you for yes. doing that. And um, so some of these questions I'm going to make. It might be a little bit easy for those that are sitting around the table or somebody that's been through the Bible before, but sometimes I want to just dip and make sure that some of the things that we think maybe are easy to, to put it out there to our viewers at home. Because I know some of you have written in and said, I'm really challenged by those Bible uh, questions and sometimes I don't get the answer right. But you know what? For years, I put you through you torment, did. but- I was tortured through that torment. Well, not torture. Okay, it wasn't torture. <laughs> but I would, I would venture to say that you would be the first to agree that a lot of times when you got the answer wrong, that was a really good mm -hmm. turning point. Yeah, in that front if of the I entire ever world. asked it again, you got it right. I, so there that's you go. True. I, I learned so, my lesson well. Lining. There you go. You live and you learn. It's not, it's yes. not terrible to get the answer wrong if you pay attention to what the right answer is and remember it for the next time. Ryan, you should give us this pep talk every time. Every so we time. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Ryan okay. is studying Samson, and you've studied the other things. So. You haven't studied what we've That's studied right. today. It's yeah. true. So, I mean, I, Thank we you never for explained us feel that when I did it. But anyway, uh, just we say. We can let off the hook, I think. There you go. It, yeah. No, I'm just saying, you know, you're studying in different areas. The Bible's 733,000 words, plus uh, if you're listening to King James. Anyway, I'm done now. <laughs> All right. So, here's our question okay. for today. We are in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, my question is this Who is the preacher? of Ecclesiastes. It says the preacher. Well, who is the preacher? I'm not giving you a multiple choice. So we, you don't have a multiple choice here. I used to get according, a multiple choice. So like according to the first according verse, to what does it say? First verse, and there's another verse that backs yes. it up. Yes. In Ecclesiastes, so if you 12. can, if you can, mm -hmm. so if you can open up your Bible quickly, if you <laughs> don't know the answer, you can get that? it well. Possibly. Do I get like a gold star? Because I you know I, I may be able to, to pull <laughs> a chart star. together with gold stars. All really, right, so, a gold star. So who is the preacher? mentioned in Ecclesiastes. Who is this person? The you son of David. Son, Solomon, the son of David. Solomon, yeah. the son of David, because yes. Ecclesiastes 1.1 gives us a hint. It says the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. But new uh, readers of the Bible might not know who the sons of David are. So Ecclesiastes 1.12 gives us a further hint. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so that definitely was the son of David who was Solomon. So Because only David and Solomon were kings over all of Israel, Solomon's son Rehoboam actually split the kingdom. And Northern and Southern Jeroboam Jeroboam and yeah. Rehoboam. Yeah, so then the sons of David became kings just over Judah. And so over. there's the historical you know, there backup for it. Every time it. you've always deferred to your sister, you know, she's no, always been the it. one. He's okay, I'm just he's saying. He's being a gentleman. Sometimes there's okay. strength in silence, yeah. right? Right, I got your back. <laughs> yeah, I got your you. back. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why you're picking on me here on yeah. live television. <laughs>